This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Little Frenchman and His Water Lot by George Pope Morris How much real comfort everyone might enjoy if he would be contented with lot in which heaven has cast him, and how much trouble would be avoided if people would only let well alone. A moderate independence, quietly and honestly procured, is certainly every way preferable, even to immense possessions achieved by the wear and tear of mind and body so necessary to procure them. Yet there are very few individuals, let them be doing ever so well in the world, who are not always straining every nerve to the better, and this is one of the many causes why failures in business so frequently occur among us. The present generation seem unwilling to realize by slow and sure degrees, but choose rather to set their whole hopes upon a single cast, which either makes or marks them forever. Gentle reader, do you remember Monsieur Poupou? He used to keep a small toy store in Chatham, near the corner of Pearl Street. You must recollect him, of course. He lived there for many years, and was one of the most polite and accommodating of shopkeepers. When a juvenile, you have bought jobs and marvels of him a thousand times. To be sure you have, and seen his vinegar visage lighted up with a smile as you flung him the coppers, and you have laughed at his little straight queue and his dimity breeches and all the other oddities that made up the everyday apparel of my little Frenchman. Ah, I perceive you recollect him now. Well then, there lives Monsieur Poupou, ever since he came from the delightful Paris, as he wont to call the city of his nativity. There he took in the pennies for his kickshaws, there he laid aside five thousand dollars against a rainy day, there he was a, as happy as a lark, and there, in all humane probability, he would have been to this very day a respected and substantial citizen, had he been willing to let well alone. But Monsieur Poupou had heard strange stories about the prodigious rise in real estate, and, having understood that most of his neighbors had become suddenly rich by speculating in lot, he instantly grew dissatisfied with his own lot, for Swift determined to shut up shop, turn everything into cash, and set about making money in right down earnest. No sooner said than done, and our quondam storekeeper, a few days afterward, attended an extensive sale of real estate at the Merchants Exchange. There was the dog dictionary with his beautiful and inviting lithographic maps, old lots as smooth and square and enticingly laid out as possible, and there were the speculators, and there, in the midst of them, stood Monsieur Poupou. Here they are, gentlemen, said he of the hammer, the most valuable lots ever offered for sale. Give me a bid for them. One hundred each, said the bystander. One hundred! said the dictionary, scarcely enough to pay for the maps. One hundred, going, and fifty, gone. Mr. H., they are yours. A novel purchase. You'll sell those same lots in less than a fortnight for fifty thousand dollars profit. Monsieur Poupou pricked up his ears at this, and was lost in astonishment. This was a much easier way, certainly, of accumulating riches than selling toys in Chatham Street and he determined to buy and mend his fortune without delay. The auditioner proceeded in his sale, other parcels were offered and disposed of, and all the purchasers were promised immense advantages for their enterprise. At last came a more valuable parcel than all the rest. The company pressed around Stan, and Monsieur Poupou did the same. I now offer you, gentlemen, this magnificent lot delightfully situated on Long Island with valuable water privileges, property in fee, title indisputable, terms of sale, cash, 
deeds ready for delivery immediately after the sale. How much for them? Give them a start of something. How much? The auditioner looked around. There were no bidders. At last, he caught the eye of Monsieur Poupou. Did you say one hundred, sir? Beautiful lots, valuable water privileges. Shall I say one hundred for you? Oui, monsieur. I'll give you one hundred dollars a piece for the lot with the valuable water privilege. C'est ça. One hundred, only one hundred a piece for these sixty valuable lots. Only one hundred. Going, 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 gone. Monsieur Poupou was the fortunate possessor. The auctioneer congratulated him. The sale closed and the company dispersed. Pardonnez-moi, monsieur, said Poupou as the auctioneer descended his pedestal. You shall excuse moi if I shall go to, to votre bureau, your counting house. They are quick to make everything sure with the respect to the lot with the valuable water privilege. One little bird in the hand, he works two in the tree, c'est vrai, eh? Certainly, sir. Well then, alors. And the gentleman repaired to the counting house, where the six thousand dollars were paid and the deeds of the property delivered. Monsieur Poupou put this carefully in his pocket, and as he was about taking his leave, the auctioneer made him a present of the lithographic outline of the lots, which was a very liberal thing on his part, considering the map was a beautiful specimen of that glorious art. Poupou could not admire it sufficiently. There were these sixty lots, as uniform as possible, and his little grey eyes sparkled like diamonds as they wandered from one end of the spacious sheet to the other. Poupou's heart was as light as a feather, and he snapped his fingers in the very wantonness of joy as he repaired to Dalmonico's and ordered the first good French dinner that had gladdened his palate since his arrival in America. After having discussed his repast, he washed it down with a bottle of Joyce old claret. He resolved upon a visit to Long Island to view his purchase. He consequently immediately hired a horse and gig, crossed the Brooklyn Ferry, and drove along the margin of the river to the wallabout, the location in question. Our friend, however, was not a little perplexed to find his property. Everything on the map was as fair and even as possible, while all the grounds about him were as undulated as they could well be imagined, and there was an elbow of the East River thrusting itself quite into the reefs of the land, which seemed to have no business there. This puzzled the Frenchman exceedingly, and, being a stranger in those parts, he called to a farmer in an adjacent field. Mon ami, are you acquainted with this part of the country, eh? Yes, I was born here, and know every inch of it. Ah, c'est bien, that will do and Frenchman got out of the gig, tied the horse, and produced his lithographic map. Then, maybe, you'll have the kindness to show me the sixty lot which I have bought with the, the valuable water privilege. The farmer glanced his eyes over the paper. Yes, sir, with pleasure. If you will be good enough to get into my boat, I will row you out to them. What did you say, sir? My friend, said the farmer, this section of Long Island has recently been bought up by the speculators of New York and laid out for a great city. But the principal street is only visible at low tide. When this part of East River is filled up, it will be just there. Your lots, as you will perceive, are beyond it and are now all under water. At first, the Frenchman was incredulous. He could not believe his senses. As the facts, however, gradually broke up on him, he shut one eye, squinted obliquely at the heavens, the river, the farmer, and then he turned away 
and squinted at them all over again. There was this process, sure enough. But then it could not be perceived, for there was a river flowing over it. He drew a box from his waistcoat pocket, opened it with an emphatic knock, opened the lid, took a pinch of snuff and restored it to his waistcoat pocket as before. Pupu was evidently in trouble, having thoughts which often lie too deep for tears. And, as his grief was also too big for words, he untied his horse, jumped into his gig and returned to the dictionary in hot haste. It was near night when he arrived at the auction room, his horse in a foam and himself in a fury. Dr. Tuner was leaning back in his chair, with his legs stuck out of a low window, quietly smoking a cigar after the labors of the day and humming the music from the last new opera. Monsieur, I have much pleasure to find you chez vous at home. Ah, Poupou! Glad to see you. Take a seat, old boy. But I shall not take the seat, sir. No. Why, what's the matter? Oh, beaucoup de matter. I have been to see the grand lot that you sell me today. Well, sir, I hope you like your purses. No, sir, I no like him. I am sorry for it. But there is no ground for your complaint. No, sir. There is no ground at all. The ground is all water. You joke. I no joke. I never joke. Je n'entends pas la rire, sir. Voulez-vous have the kindness to give me back the money that I pay? Certainly not. Then will you be so good as to take the East River off the top of my lot? That's your business, sir, not mine. Then I make one mauvaise affaire, one grand mistake. I hope not. I don't think you have thrown your money away in the land. No, sir, but I throw it away in the water. That's not my fault. Yes, sir, but it is your fault. You're a very grand rascal to swindle me out of the l'argent. Hello, old poo You grow personal. And if you can't keep a civil tongue in your head, you must go out of my counting room. Where shall I go to, huh? To the devil, for all I care, you foolish old Frenchman, said the Oak Dictionary, waxing warm. But, sir, I will not go to the devil to oblige you, replied the Frenchman, waxing warmer. You shoot me out of all the dollar lot I make in Chatham Street. But I will not go to the devil for all that. I wish you may go to the devil yourself, you damn Yankee, to hell. And I will go and run myself to the suite, right away. You can make a better use of your water privileges, old boy. Ah, merit, merit, record. Ah, mon Dieu, je suis abîmé. I am ruined. I am done up. I am break all into ten thousand little pieces. I am one lame duck, and I shall waddle across the grand ocean for Paris, which is the only valuable water privilege that is left me at present. Poor Poupou was as good as his word. He sailed in the next packet, and arrived in Paris almost as penniless as the day he left it. Should anyone feel disposed to doubt the veritable circumstances he recorded let him cross the East River to the wallabout, and Farmer J will row him out to the very place where the poor Frenchman's lots still remain, underwater. End of The Little Frenchman and His Water Lots by George Pope Morris